Mr. Secretary, thank you for being here today. Um, really quickly, your department oversees the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, which I'm sure you're aware recently proposed the, uh, the CAFE standards for 27 to 32. You're also likely aware that the EPA agency has separately proposed overlapping greenhouse gas standards. Uh, sir, can you explain what actions you've taken to coordinate with the EPA Administrator Reagan uh, to ensure that auto manufacturers that comply with greenhouse gas regulations are also compliant with fuel economy standards issued by DOT? Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, we recognize that uh, the, the development of two related but different uh, um, sets of standards, one from NHTSA with regard to fuel economy, one from EPA uh, with regard to emissions, uh, can be a complicated thing for industry to deal with if we're not as uh, transparent and coordinated as possible and as appropriate, while of course recognizing we're still separate agencies. Uh, and so we have worked to the extent appropriate uh, in coordination uh, with EPA and with the White House. Uh, All right, well, I'll get more specific. Bill. Specific to the DOT. Mm -hmm. uh, CAFE standards in model year 2732 uh, indicate the automakers will pay 10 to $13 billion in civil penalties for noncompliance. Mr. Secretary, will these penalties increase or decrease the vehicle cost for the average American buyer? Well, uh, if there's a failure to comply and there's a penalty assessed and the automaker puts that penalty on the back of the consumer, then their costs will increase. On the other hand, the consumer will be saving money thanks to the uh, reduced gas that they'll be buying thanks to the standards. And we estimate uh, saving about $1,000 uh, per Okay, so let's, let's, assume, let's assume that we go forward. Are those penalties uh, reinvested by DOT in programs that would actually support more efficient vehicles, pollution reduction, or workforce development? Or do they go to the general fund as essentially a, a, an implicit tax on the American people, which is the role of, of Congress? I'm not in a position to speak to the use of penalty funding that hasn't been collected yet, uh, but certainly uh, think that partnering with Congress, it could be appropriate to make sure it gets assigned in ways that further the policy goal, provided they don't amount to undercutting uh, the purpose of the penalty in the first place, which is to get the automaker to do the right thing and comply so that there's no penalty at all. Uh, would another right thing be profit sharing with UAW? Say again? Would another right thing be profit sharing with the UAW? We certainly think that uh, auto workers ought to get their fair share of the growth and the So you agree that profit price. sharing with the UAW is something that is, is proper. Um, these well, penalties, just to be clear, I'm are, not at the negotiating table and I'm not going to... Neither of us are, but there. both of us, but, I'm uh, here to protect we my, my workers here. Efforts to make so sure uh, with the president's unrealistic projection um, for electric vehicle sales uh, in the future, 67% uh, by year 2032, uh, affecting the profitability of these plants is going to take dollars away from auto workers. The approximate formula is about $1,000 per auto worker uh, for a billion dollars for the automakers. Um, if penalties are levied on the automakers, then this will take money away from the auto workers. Is the president aware that he's literally taking money away from UAW workers by impugning their bonuses? I just don't think that's the right characterization because it assumes that the auto workers will fail to comply with the law. The automakers will fail to comply with the law. Uh, look, ever since the first CAFE standards were introduced in the Nixon administration, an industry said there's no way we could possibly have vehicles more efficient than 13 and a half miles a gallon. There's been a push pull to make sure that we have the maximum feasible. But in the end, industry got it done. Uh, and today, uh, American consumers have saved billions and billions of dollars. Uh, and, of course, we have cleaner air because of these standards. And I have a lot of confidence that industry can continue as they have done in the past. I have a lot of confidence in the industry the as well. But requiring going from 67 percent, and you mentioned earlier tripling, but that tripling is up to 7 percent now. And requiring that in just a handful of years goes beyond aggressive and goes into the area of dangerous. Uh, look, I... I really appreciate you bringing up Penelope Rose and, uh, and Joseph August. Uh, I have uh, my little boys, and we have a hybrid electric vehicle that we plug in as well. But there is a housing crisis throughout America with affordability. And right now, this is not only going to affect the automotive industry, it's going to affect average, everyday Americans. Based on the president's unrealistic projection, uh, can you explain what's being done in, in apartment complexes uh, for, for Americans, whether it be folks suffering from a housing crisis in, in northern Michigan or in my district, in, uh, in the southern portion of my district, um, making vehicle charging convenient at a reasonable cost for people already paying rent that's high? Um, what, what do you think is, uh, is acceptable um, and, and what's the DOT doing um, to, uh, to help make this charging more affordable? 
Thanks, it's an excellent question, and it's one of the reasons why we have the uh, community uh, fueling infrastructure funding alongside the, uh, or as part of the NEVI program. We recognize that especially, look, if you have a single family home, you, you already have charging infrastructure. You can plug, if you have a garage, you can plug in there. But if you're in a multifamily dwelling, as many low income Americans are, you can't assume that you're gonna have that kind of charging infrastructure. And you also can't assume that it is yet profitable for a company to put it in. That is exactly why we are applying the funds that were provided by Congress to make sure that in these areas where it just doesn't yet pencil out for a company to do it, uh, that we were buying down that difference so that some of the very Americans who would most benefit in terms of their family budget from the savings that come with uh, filling up with electricity instead of gas can actually access it through affordable and convenient chargers. Uh, one last thing, Mr. Secretary. Uh, seeing the electric vehicles don't pay a corresponding user fee for the highway, tru uh, highway trust fund, uh, such as the 18.4 cents per gallon for gasoline. Uh, how does the CAFE uh, reduce collections in, in, in the trust fund? I don't believe there's anything in the DOT's proposed rulemaking explaining uh, what the high rate of electrification will mean for improvements to our nation's roads and bridges. Uh, effectively, this rising debt of the uh, federal government will put increased pressure on Congress and this committee uh, to fund infrastructure improvements through the general fund. And, and that seems to be a major omission in the administration being honest about ensuring our nation's roads and bridges don't deteriorate further due to the higher cafe and greenhouse gas requirements and further pushing the cost of this EV transition onto folks who are least able to afford it. Can you comment on how we can maintain our infrastructure with the increased weight uh, and decreased funding for our infrastructure? Sure, and again, ever since uh, CAFE standards began in the Nixon administration improving uh, the average efficiency of a car past 13 and a half miles per gallon, uh, there have, has been the effect alongside all of the money that it saves drivers and car owners uh, that it also means that uh, because Americans are paying less for gas, they're paying less gas tax. We think Americans paying less for gas is a good thing. We think Americans paying less gas tax because they're getting more efficient vehicles is a good thing. But we recognize that uh, that means there have to be alternative ways to support the Highway Trust Fund. Historically, Congress has filled that gap through uh, general dollars. That's not the only way to do it, but it's certainly a legitimate way to do it, and it's what has been happening ever since that gap first opened up. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. My time has expired, and Chairman now recognizes Mr. Moulton.